ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first session of LFL 2019. 2019 elections and the future of the Indian democracy. Arun Shuri, N. Ram, Priya Sahagal, and R. Jagannathan in conversation with Sanjay Pinto. Mr. Shuri, of course, needs no further introduction. We've been honored to have him as our chief guest this morning. Mr. N. Ram as well, chairman of the Hindu Publishing Group. He's a political journalist. His honors include the Padma Bhushan for journalism in 1990, the Asian Investigative Journalist of the Year Award from the Press Foundation of Asia in 1990, and his book, Why Scams Are Here to Stay, Understanding Political Corruption in India, was published in 2017. Priya Sehgal is a senior executive editor at NewsX Channel, where she anchors two political shows, The Roundtable and Cover Story. Her book, The Contenders, came out in November 2018, which profiles 16 Gen Next politicians, capturing a potentially transformative moment in Indian politics. R. Jagannathan is a journalist with over 42 years' experience in business and general journalism. He has been part of many launch teams, including Business Today, DNA, and FirstPost.com, and has helped revamp many business publications as editor of Financial Express, Indian Management, and Business World. Sanjay Pinto is an advocate at the Madras High Court, a columnist and author. Before his transition from the newsroom to the courtroom, Sanjay was the face of NDTV in South India for 15 years. A former national debating champion, Sanjay is a public speaking mentor and a guest lecturer on media law at national law schools in India. I now hand over to him and the rest of the panelists for the first session. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Campaign in poetry, govern in prose. This Mario Cuomo gem could be tweaked in the Indian context to campaign in lyrics by voters for a song. Now, apart from this big mismatch between what is promised at elections and what is actually delivered, it's time to actually put the spotlight on the functioning of the four estates of democracy. We all know, ladies and gentlemen, that the CBI and the RBI have been in the news for all the wrong reasons. We all know what's been happening with the quota system. We all know that in many ways, dissent has come to be associated with terms like urban naxals and anti-nationals and prostitutes. Or are we all just content with blaming God and Mr. Modi for all our problems? Uh, first off the block, Ms. Jagannathan, this quota system, 10% quota, many believe it's a placebo, it's a, uh, it's a last minute act of desperation. Ravi Shankar Prasad says it's a six in the slog overs, but is it a case of hit wicket because it's been challenged in the Supreme Court? And if you can explain for the audience here, how did the government arrive at this eight lakh figure uh, when it taxes people who, pay, who earn more than two and a half lakh rupees? And, uh, about eight years ago, the planning commission said anyone who spends more than 32 rupees a day is not considered poor. Look, uh, how they arrived at the figure is something that you must ask the government, but I think it makes no sense to have that kind of figure. And not a great fan of quotas in general, except for a really uh, demonstrated backward thing. The only plus point in the quota, I would say, is that at least it tries to remove all other uh, caste considerations and community considerations. But overall, I think they've opened a Pandora's box because now there is now going to be no limit on the kind of demands that will come from various social groups, economically backwards groups, or whatever the kind of groups. So I think once you breach that, uh, there was an invisible line, that 49% line that the Supreme Court set. But the Manad, of course, has already breached it. And many other state governments are doing it in, in practice, if not in uh, principle. 
So I think uh, the, the worst part of the quota thing is this, that you are now opened the Pandora's box for endless demands on quotas, and that's what's wrong with it. And as far as the limit is concerned, I think it's uh, something that's going to be arbitrarily set, no matter what you do, because if the idea is to uh, send a signal to certain groups that felt that they have been discriminated against, even if historically that hasn't been the case. I think that's the kind of message the government is sending. So I don't know whether it's a <laughs> game changer or whatever it is. But is it a as message of nervousness as well? Sign of nervousness? Yeah, all, all governments in the fifth year of governance are nervous. I think <laughs> if, you, uh, if you actually see, what do you think happened? I mean, you have the Food Security Act, the Land Acquisition Act, the division of Andhra Pradesh coming in the last few months of the UPA, right? You have those kind of things coming in Fair every enough. single government. So Fair enough. Mr. No. Mr. Ram, uh, the timing of uh, this quota, uh, Mr. Modi tried to defend it saying that, look, at some point or the other you have, you keep having by-elections, uh, and if we had done it a few months earlier, then they would have said it is an eye, with, uh, it's an eye on elections in the Hindi heartland. Uh, again, drawing uh, reference to his pet idea of one nation, one election, is it possible at all, is it feasible to have uh, one election, simultaneous elections to the parliament and state assemblies at all? No, that's uh, absurd to uh, even think about it because a government could be elected and you could fall uh, at any time. You could fall midterm. So what happens then if you uh, defer uh, the election in that particular state, for example, to, uh, to a particular uh, a date far, quite far away? So it's just absurd and it's, uh, I think it's a foolish idea. As for uh, the 10%, I think it could, I was talking to a friend, a well -informed, politically well-informed friend, and he said, uh, this is going to backfire, because the impact on others as the well. Quota. Whatever be the motive, whatever be the timing, all that has been explained already, but uh, uh, it could backfire, the consequence. Okay, Mr. Shori, uh, we have had a press conference unprecedented, not from the Prime Minister, but uh, four sitting Supreme Court judges who expressed serious concerns about the independence of the judiciary. Now, as somebody who's gone now with the review petition on Rafael, uh, many in the BJP, for instance, uh, believe that if at all Rafael is going to be a factor in this election, that it would probably be what Bofors was to the Congress, what Tuji was to the UPA government. Do you think the BJP would be able to, with its uh, national security slogan, be able to drown uh, voices, the allegations of corruption by the opposition? No, sir, if nobody follows these things up, for instance, if no newspaper follows up any fact regarding Rafael, if nobody reports the fact that HAL, 31,000 crores were taken away from them last year, uh, 11,000 crores taken on by the government, forcing them to buy back the shares which the government held. Un this thing. And then 20,000 crores not being paid for work which they have completed. And 20,000 crores being paid to uh, this uh, Dassault for work they have not begun. <laughs> if nothing will be followed up, then naturally Modi can say, as Shah has said yesterday, there is no stain on Modi's government. But that is because those who I mean, there are so many people who, who here um, in the media who will just not follow up or report anything. And as far as the courts are concerned, our going to the court really, I have, if I may, Gopal is here, but I have learned a lesson from Gandhiji's statements in Champaran. See, when he goes, his principle used to always be, you must have uh, put your demand at the minimum. So the the, what, he, what was his demand in Champaran? He said, set up a committee to look at the condition of the indigo cultivators. Now, if the government sets up a committee, then it has bent to the people. If it doesn't set up the committee, then Gandhiji's point is proven that wait, this, these people will not even set up a committee to look at your condition and you look upon them as your my bab. So also with the courts, I have said from the very beginning that in taking these facts, incontrovertible facts, no procedure followed, nobody knew the French president saying we were not involved, we were forced to take Anil Ambani, etc. All those facts being on record, 
and the Supreme Court gives a judgment, which as I have shown, is would you would throw the student out of your class if he had given it because it is completely plagiarized from the note which the government gave them. I have shown it sentence by sentence, para by para. Completely plagiarized. So I feel that in these matters, we are not on trial. The court is on trial. <laughs> and we have served the purpose of actually uh, you know, disillusioning people that yes, the court will stand up for your freedom or for honesty or for anything else. And the court has again proven it in the way it has dealt with Alok Verma. So we should persist, we should keep disclosing the facts, others don't follow up, and then don't complain. If, uh, supposing these facts do not reach the people because of this mainstream media silence, and then the people keep uh, uh, being under the illusion that yes, Modi's government is an honest government, and they vote for it, then don't complain later on about what happens to freedom of speech in the next round. Mr. Ram, if I may bring you in here, I mean, you spoke about the chilling effect in your address. Uh, here again, defamation today is being used as a sword and not as a shield as it's meant to be. Defamation cases, a 10,000 rupee suit uh, against NDTV, for instance, in the, for reporting this. How do you see this playing out really, Rafael, in the elections? No, before that, I, I, I just want to follow up. Uh, yes, it, it's striking that uh, the mainstream media have not investigated this seriously. You know, just compare it with Bofors. Everyone was trying to get it. He was trying to get it. India Today was in the, in the race. The Hindu uh, did the investigation. Others also did. Today, this is uh, lacking with so much information. Their, their petition. Of the ownership of uh, news organizations? I think it's a complex, uh, it, it's a, there are many factors behind this. It's ownership, it's, you know, that goes back to his, uh, the theme of, his, the main theme of uh, Arun's uh, uh, opening remarks, inaugural remarks. Uh, something is happening, it's greed, he said it's greed, it could be some, in some cases fear, they are vulnerable. Uh, journalists themselves may have a different uh, approach, I don't know, we have to research this. Uh, but uh, what, what is striking is the poverty of investigative journalism on many of the key issues of the day heading to elections. Uh, uh, this, uh, TV, uh, TV channels do a lot of investigations. It's mainly stings. It's they're using secret cameras, secret recorders, and so on. But, you know, what is investigative journalism all about? You could have a separate panel on that. But... Uh, on defamation, yes, I think we have a very draconian system, uh, and uh, uh, you know, you, uh, it's called slap, strategic, you know, you intervene to shut up the public, and that's, I think, the motive. You know nothing is going to happen in courts, except uh, the process is the punishment, as they say, but it, it, uh, it creates silence and fear in the media, and uh, we, we, you know, this is the problem. You have to break out of it. We have to break, yeah. want to sure. add one sentence. But you see, we should, be, we should be prepared to suffer that little punishment of the process. Again, Gandhiji's phrase, it's not that Indians don't want freedom. It is just that they don't want to do anything to get it. So how many and, news and organizations would be, back be, the reporters who break be, these stories? And would be happier still if they made some money in the process? <laughs> So how can you, what is the problem? Yes, there is a process, there is, uh, yes, we will have to go to the court many times, but we should be prepared to go, okay, I'm coming here. Then what will they do? Priya, this, uh, the, you know, this whole atmosphere of intimidation, I mean, be it the killing of Gauri Lankesh, defamation suits being slapped, uh, to what extent do you feel threatened as a working journalist? And do you really have the backing of your owners? Without the backing of the owners, you really can't expose the stories. Mr. Shori also said it's basically what is happening here is also the owners, there is, you know, the pressure is never on the journalist per se, you know, no journalist really has threat for life here for life, at least in the mainstream media, in the regional parties, in the state level, it is different. But let me give you an example. See, most of the stories are broken by the vernacular media, really. Most of the stories are broken or not broken or shut up also by the vernacular media. But uh, one example I want to give you, I was at a book release function in the capital last week in Delhi, and uh, a cabinet minister was on the stage, there were various members of political parties, and a member 
member of the audience got up and he asked the cabinet minister, he says, uh, he began by talking about Gauri Lankesh, he talked about the spirit of intimidation and intolerance that is prevailing in the country. Uh, you know, questioners tend to give long-minded speeches. He gave his speech, somebody tried to shut him up, he says, the, the minister said, no, no, let him finish. The minute he finished, he looked at him and he says, now you sit down. And the fact, and the tone was like this. And the fact that you can look at me in the eye and ask such a question means that there is no atmosphere of intolerance. That's it. So this is how they, you know, this is the subtle messages that are given. What happens with the owners, I don't know. At least, you know, I want to say one thing, I, you know, within at least my shows at NewsX, we do have a lot of people. One thing that one can do is, if you want diverse views, if the journalists if themselves cannot express a certain view because of various pressures, get a panel that can. You know, you can always have someone like Mr. Arun Shuri coming and speaking or someone. So that way it is what you call the balanced panel and that is one way out of it. All right, the person who pays the piper calls a tune, but uh, Mr. Jagannathan, uh, moving away to, again, to democracy here, which is part of the topic. Um, why is that, do you think we'll have a sort of a presidential battle, style battle in 2019 this year, uh, a David versus Goliath sort of battle, and why is that we cannot have the two main contenders, at least, uh, you know, have a debate with or without the hug? Yeah, I would certainly think that's useful. Uh, but the thing is, I think uh, the problem is when you arbitrarily decide, in a US presidential system, there are only two candidates. So it's easier to have it. In a place like India, you're not going to have say that these are the only, it's a tragedy that in 2019, you're going to have a binary choice. The choice is Modi or not Modi. There's not even another person who says, I am going to tackle Modi, right? You have a choice between Modi or not Modi. Huh? That's so where we are going to have a debate no, between... There is, there is a, you know, a grand alliance, Mr. Ram, if I can bring you in yeah. here. A grand alliance that is being formed. Uh, M.K. Stalin, in fact, has, uh, has uh, projected Rahul Gandhi as a prime ministerial candidate. Deva Gowda has followed suit. But your good friend, Mr. Sitaram Yachuri, says this is not a presidential-style race. We really can't have a prime ministerial candidate before elections. How do you see this playing out? Yeah, I think it's not a presidential contest by any means. Um, the, the DMK has been consistent. Whenever it's been an alliance with the, um, Congress, uh, with the Congress, it's had no problem in projecting the Congress leader, particularly if the Congress leader is from a Gandhi family, to, uh, uh, to the top job. They are consistent in this. Of course, they've also been with the BJP. Uh, but now they are firmly with the Congress. Stalin so, yesterday said that uh, sir, but, Modi is uh, not Vajpayee. Pardon? Mr. Stalin said that Modi is not another Vajpayee. Which is true. <laughs> 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 in a, literally and uh, in every other sense. Uh, uh, but um, should Congress, uh, should Rahul Gandhi stake a claim to be Prime Minister? Absolutely not. That will be a recipe for disaster. Uh, it is not... I'm not underplaying his role. He's really risen. I think his stock has gone up. There's no question about it. He's been extremely aggressive and given a very low base from which they started. He's done, I would say, exceptionally well for his party. But having said that, just look at the picture of the Congress from 44 seats. Where is it in Uttar Pradesh? Arun and I were having a bit of a chat on that. Will they all get together? That's a big question. If they do, we can bet that the BJP will, be not, will not have a majority. We'll, we'll have far less than a majority if that happens. There's no question about it. That really is but the will it happen? question in this election. Will it Mr. happen? And I think so far, the, Rahul Gandhi has been uh, uh, sensible, uh, and the party also, in not making a preemptive claim for, for, the, for that job. But if the Congress does unexpectedly well in the election, in the Lok Sabha election to come, then I think uh, that will come on the agenda. But the DMK, re re Sanjay, remember, is the one pa regional party, a powerful party, which does not aspire to, uh, to leadership at the center. It, it may want to be represented, but it certainly doesn't want the top job. Mr. Karananadi made that very clear. Before that, that's Anadare, and uh, Stalin, I think, is being consistent when he uh, does this. Mr. Shauri, uh, the principle of your enemy is my friend. Do you really see these allies coming together despite the ideological differences to defeat a common enemy in the BJP? Do you see that happening given all their internal contradictions, the infighting? Uh, sir, there's a, lo a lot of inf uh, the, uh, Firstly, uh, to think of this election as a presidential election is exactly what Modi would want you to do. 
this is an election of one and three quarter persons to rule India, one being Shah and three quarters being Modi. <laughs> so whether that, you, whether the people want that or they want a group which will actually represent different parts of the country. And I would presume that the best thing for them to do is not to um, you know, point to one person that this is our alternate to Modi, but to assure the people of two things. One, exactly as you, uh, the point that you made, that yes, we will be together in the interests of the country. That assurance has to be given by word and deed. You can't say, I will not go to your meeting. You can't say, announce in public, I'll give you only two seats. Don't talk about each other. Don't talk about each other in public at all. Talk to each other. And that assurance you have to give. The second assurance I think they should give is that, look here, please have faith that when, once the elections are over, and if we are to form the government, then we will have a person of the following qualifications. All the qualifications that distinguish Modi for not having. <laughs> that he will, they will, the person will be humble enough to seek the best advice from experts. That the person will respect regional autonomy. That the person will be tolerant. That the person would respect our constitutional freedoms. All those things. Who do you, those who's that one leader you think would have all these qualities? That, I don't want to violate my own prescription. <laughs> <laughs> no, we should not think in those terms. We should think in terms of the qualities that you would like in that person. Could be anybody. And actually in that group that you would want these things. Chandra Babu and Naidu, Mamta Banerjee, who would you... No, you keep coming back. That is exactly playing Modi's game. <laughs> For the first time I've been and accused of playing exactly. Modi's game. Right. So I would think that <laughs> one should... Uh, unwittingly. Uh, yes, unwittingly. I mean, that we should never fall for that thing at all. And for each of them, I feel it is... Uh, the, what is required is a phrase that Dr. Farooq Abdullah used uh, 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 when we were talking. He said to me, Dekhiye, jab tak we, unless we approach this whole process and phase in a spirit of sacrifice, we will not get anywhere. If you say, no, I want three seats, or you say two seats, you can't on the one hand say the country is in danger and then break alliances on two or three seats. And the leaders must remember that it is not just the country which is so in but, danger, so but they are each of them personally in danger. So but governments have fallen with one vote as well here. I mean, we've seen that. Yes, so, so that's what should not happen. In, the, in this connection, can we look at some uh, numbers for a minute or two? Sure. Can you put up that slide, please? Yeah, this is, uh, this is turnout. I think it's going to make, I, I don't know if, I'm sorry, people in the back can't really see it, but those here in the middle rows can. But that's the, from 1951 to 2014, that's the turnout for Lok Sabha elections. And the simple point is, I think, uh, I think turnout will make a difference. Usually, if there is a higher voter turnout swing against, vote. against, not always, a, a, if there's a swing against a ruling party, the turnout tends to go up, but not always. Uh, uh, if there are strong emotions, turnout tends to go up. That's the simple point. But the next one, you can't, is the real, real thing. The, in the Lok Sabha, Ar Arun mentioned uh, 30, you know, the BJP got a majority on the basis of 31% of the popular vote, national popular vote. It was unevenly concentrated or distributed, but that's the figure. The Congress was 19.31 and so on. And this simply, to, I put this up simply to make the point that it's precarious for a party that has had a majority. If there's any indication that there's a swing away from that party, and everyone else gets together on the lines uh, Arun Shauri uh, advocated, in fact. Uh, I think uh, the outcome is more or less guaranteed that they will not get a majority. And I just want to illustrate this with the third slide, which is from Uttar Pradesh. BJP in 
2014 got 42.63% and won 71 out of 80 seats. The Samajwadi Party got 22.35% of the votes in that state, the valid votes, got five seats. BSP, Mayawati's party, got 19.77%, not, not small, and got zero seats. And the Congress, 7.53% and got two seats. And another unrecognized party got two seats on the basis of 367 So if there's any indication that this 42.63, there's a swing away, there's a decline in that, and the others get together, I think uh, Uttar Pradesh is there for the taking for the opposition. That's the simple point these numbers will show. Priya, talking of the swing, I mean, in the last year, things have changed for the BJP. Uh, they lost uh, seven out of the nine bipoles, Lok Sabha bipoles, in which they had won in 2014. Uh, they lost, they won only two of the 16 by-elections to state assemblies. So what does this speak about what the BJP had for long been projecting as the invincible halo of Modi. So the halo is slipping, definitely. You know, even the BJP leaders in private mentioned that. In fact, we are told that uh, the, you know, earlier on at parliamentary party meetings, when the prime minister used to walk in, there used to be a standing ovation. After the three assembly polls, the standing ovation was not so loud. So and will thunderous. this lead to a change in terms of the BJP's election mascot? There is talk of Nitin Gadkari. No, Gatkari. no, no. Because uh, at the end of the day, you know, the, uh, the good part for the BJP is the fact that they do want to make it a Modi versus rest. And the minute that narrative happens, there is no one else. The opposition cannot come to any one figure. Look at what is happening in UP today. Mayavati and Akhilesh are going to be announcing an alliance, leaving the Congress out. Now, you know, when I wrote my book, it was actually about the young generation. There's, al there's always an agency called the CBI. Yes, but you know, despite the CBI, Mayawati and Akhilesh are announcing their alliance. So, you know, also the term is ending. This government has got two months left to go. How much of CBI can they push? And has the CBI itself got his act together? But to come back to my point, the fact is that, you know, I, I spoke to Omar Abdullah and he made a very good point. Perhaps he has lesser stakes than Akhilesh. He says, look, Congress is the only pan-national party. So, you know, to uh, assume a government without the Congress and not taking the Congress along is stupidity on our part. Mamta cannot fight them in JNK or Orissa, neither can Mayawati fight them in West Bengal. So end of the day, you have to take the Congress along. Now, unfortunately, unfortunately, the way I see it, Akhilesh Yadav's eyes are not just on 2019 or even 2022. I feel that his fight is really, the, he knows that the biggest fight of his career will not be against Modi or Mayavati, but against Rahul Gandhi and that for the Prime Ministership of India. So that is why he is not ready to let the Congress grow, maybe cutting his nose to spite himself. Mr. Jagannathan, uh, you know, the, the nature of political discourse, the campaign of hatred and, that we see, uh, again, the need to completely, you know, hashtag journalism that we find uh, where the social media sets the agenda for the mainstream media. Mr. Modi has not addressed a single press conference in the last five years, uh, but he has his monkey bats. Uh, is the, has, the, has the social media today made regular media interaction redundant? Yeah, in many ways, because once you become presidential and the entire campaign is based on the image you build, Nobody wants to sully the image by having uh, inconvenient things called It's like a corporate CEO. They will not talk to a journalist who is going to be critical of his company, right? So th that same thing happens in the US. I don't think any, I mean, if you leave out Trump actually, no US president ever gives an interview and things like that, though they do have press conferences. But if you actually look at the nature of Indian press conferences, I have not seen a single press conference where anybody has held the uh, person speaking to account for a very simple reason. Press conferences follow a simple format, uh, you ask a question and suppose he just passes it off with a joke and then he say next, then you don't get a follow-up. So, so after uh, the press conference, even exclusives are reserved for those who ask yeah, convenient right. questions. Yeah, so the press conferences are actually nonsense. You have to say that uh, press conference will somehow bring some but kind of But it exposes thing. you to a variety of questions. It does, as opposed it does. to an interview that you give to your favorite channel or your Correct. favorite news anchor. Correct. Correct. A press conference, there is a level of objectivity with the press conference. Why is that our leaders are unwilling to face the media? I think they should. And in fact, I think it's very easy because given the format of press conferences, you can actually get away with uh, saying nothing. You know, you can just say a joke or deflect the question or uh, uh, just deflect the answer. The next question can be to some favorable journalist. So it doesn't work. So unless you have a very hard hitting, hard talk kind of interview, where a journalist who is not uh, fe uh, feels that he has to be pay, uh, you know, uh, so, you know <laughs> has to be very uh, differential to the, whoever is in power, you're not going to get that. So press conference is actually a, not a solution. Mr. Shori, yeah. Yes, sir, there's a nice WhatsApp 
thing on this uh, ANI interview, a uh, nice thing on WhatsApp. Uh, the lady this, uh, who interviewed Modi, she's jumped up, and Modi's also jumped up. She says, uh, sir, by mistake, you have answered my next question. <laughs> you know, so well formatted. Sir, you don't have to think of a BJP thing, changing massacres or being worried and so on. You only have to look at Mr. Modi's face. He's really quite uh, uh, agitated. And his speeches are becoming more and more screechy. And this monkey bath is actually the monkey bath. <laughs> monkey bathing. And CBI. Yes, it is true that these leaders will be subjected to the CBI, but please see how afraid Modi is of the CBI today. That he could not stand an independent director and had to uh, act uh, and, and did act so swiftly. What does it speak so for the Supreme Court, sir? I mean, see here now, uh, yes, uh, Mr. Barma says the principles of natural justice were not followed in his... Uh, uh, no, no, not only natural justice, it is the entirely orchestrated thing that, uh, that the way it has been done. They were so afraid that he may register the FIR, which he has to do under the Supreme Court's own judgment in Lalitha Kumari's case. But they, but they were afraid that once that happens, then various things follow. He will, and the rumor is that actually he asked for some documents regarding Rafael, and that's how the first uh, round started. And the CVC report, I mean, this, look at the background of the CVC himself what his uh, reputation was. So I would think, but to get back to the substantive point that Ram was making, if you have a situation, please remember two figures, as Ram had pointed out. One, 31.69. At the height of his popularity, Mr. Modi got 31% of the vote. It's not that level of popularity today. Secondly, please remember, 60-90. He won because in the states which account for 60% of the Lok Sabha, he won 90% of the seats. Now, if you can work on a situation, and the two crucial states in this are UP and Maharashtra, and if even state-level alliances can be brought about there with this single objective, people should enforce this on their leaders, that there will be only one candidate against a BJP candidate. And you have to leave it to the dominant person or dominant persons in that state and to their large heartedness or small heartedness to select how the seats will be distributed. But that's never known to be the characteristic of Indian politics. Uh, but sir, because uh, are there going to be too many aspirants for the Prime Minister's uh, no, no, I, post I then? I don't I mean. think so. You see, if we keep repeating what, is, what has happened in the past as the only uh, uh, template on which things can happen in the future, then of course only the past will continue to uh, be repeated. But I am sure that the one person who has worked consistently for opposition unity is Mr. Modi. <laughs> he has frightened the hell out of all of them. So please, that's a new factor which has not been there earlier. So why do you discount uh, his abilities to unite these people? You seem to be in agreement, uh, Mr. Ram. Uh. Yes, I fully agree with this. Um, but uh, Sanjay, if we can finish in three to five minutes, we have it'll minutes be fair, to the, fair to the next uh, panel because we are slightly overrunning. The since we are also talking about the sacrifice future, sacrifice a little bit. The future of, of Indian democracy. Uh, you know, today a sweeper, if he doesn't perform his job, is shown the door. A defective good can be exchanged or returned. But why is that? We do not have the right to recall a candidate because. Uh, Varun Gandhi had actually brought a private member's bill, but as you know, a private member's bill in the last 49 years has never seen the light of day. To recall our candidates, because the bill actually said, even the law, commi the law commission in its 255th report had said that too much of democracy is a bad thing. Do you think that the right to recall, uh, you know, non-performing elected representatives is really the way forward in terms of electoral reforms? No. No, I don't think, I think it's out of line with uh, the, pra you know, over the practice of parliamentary democracy. You don't have it in the UK and elsewhere. And I think let's stay with our present uh, uh, constitutional system and implement uh, what needs to be done. That, that, that's more than enough. That will see us through instead of thinking of these, uh, you know, out of the box or over the top, sometimes over the top sort of 
uh, solutions that are proposed from time to time, like the presidential system and, or even proportional representation, which is a good thing uh, in the abstract, but will it, but what, what will happen in India? So on. So I think these are far away. Let's stay with the present system and Since try to reform it. The topic of democracy uh, will be... Uh, you, you've got enough problems uh, with it. Uh, it needs to be cleansed. Since we are discussing democracy, it would be unfair not to uh, throw open questions to the audience. If you can take a few questions from the audience, if you can put up your hands. Yes, sir. If the microphones can be reached to them, please. Sanjay, while the mic switch, I just want to make a quick point for Mr. Sure. Shori because he gave us that memorable line talking about the economic policies of this government that the BJP is UPA minus a cow. Somebody on social media, sorry, plus a cow, sorry. Somebody on social media has rebutted because talking about this whole temple tourism of the Congress, they are saying that Congress is BJP minus a cow. <laughs> yes, sir. By the time rule of law was there established, so by the time adult franchise came, rule of law was there. For me, without rule of law, adult franchise will not work. What issue? Okay, that's a point rather than a question, sir. We take the lady there. Uh, yes, ma'am. Sir, can you talk to us about the fear of EVM tampering? Yeah. The fear of EVM, because after every election, the side that loses, in fact, they immediately say EVMs are probably tampered with. But EVMs have proved, I mean, they've, you know, on several occasions, they've proved to be tamper-proof. I mean, they're absolutely uh, foolproof. I think the EVMs are a good thing. It, it's uh, overall. Yes. Good morning, sir. Uh, so when it comes to naming the prime ministerial candidate, the Congress is beating around the bush. So do you think this is a safe and uh, conscious and strategic move from their side? Uh, so he says the Congress is reluctant to name, it, uh, name the prime ministerial candidate of the alliance it's trying to rustle up. Will this backfire? Do we need a prime ministerial candidate? No, I don't think so. I'll, I'll give you an example. In, uh, 19, of course, that was an exceptional situation. But in 1977, do you think Mr. Charan Singh was an alternative to Mrs. Gandhi? No. Mr. Murarji Desai? No. Jagjeevan Ram? No. But similarly, in 2004, you think that uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh, of course, was behind a curtain, so not there. Was Sonia Gandhi an alternative to Atalji? You don't need them. Why are you falling for their game? You say, we are a group which is different from the BJP. The BJP has been destroyed as a party. There is no party. There is complete silence. And these one in three quarter of persons and one in-house uh, blogger. <laughs> That's all. There's nobody else. So you should, our uh, thing, theme should be, yes, here is a live group. They don't agree with each other all the time. That's India. They really represent India. And they will come together for the sake of the country, for running the country, for their own survival. That's the claim. Yes, ma'am. Sir, I will come to you next. Question is, Mr. To Mr. Arun Chori, sir, you mentioned the Pakistani poet name, and also the poetry. I want the name of the poet and the poetry also, please. So that you can do during a signing yes, ceremony, I'm sure. Okay. Just, no, what did he say? The name of the poet you quoted in your speech. Ah. Oh, Pakistan. this is of course the very, very great poet of the entire subcontinent, uh, Mr. Faiz Ahmed Faiz. And I can quote you quite a lot of things from him. It's very important to read the poetry of the Pakistani poets today because they have been through the phase which is only beginning in India now. Yes, ma'am. Uh, excuse me, the lady behind you, she put up her hand first, yes. Yes. Thank you. Good morning to all. I may or may not be an ardent Modi fan nor an admirer of the current dispensation at the center. But to be fair, we would like to hear both sides. At discussions and debates such as these, one expects that there are panelists. Madam, e are you doing a review of this discussion or are you asking a question? Equal in numbers and strength. No, it's a general observation, no, holding no, views from both no, sides. Uh, the panelists I, can't be all with one thought, one stream of yeah, thought. I, I, my, okay, my, my, uh, my, my response to that is, we don't believe in false equivalence. 
two people on this side and two people on that side. That and, would make it uh, And secondly, secondly, there's plenty in the media which has been alluded to, which you can read. That's fine, but we are sticking to hear a discussion, debate, where there should be people representing both sides. Uh, no, actually it's a so conversation, it's not even a debate. That is happening, so. that has ruined journalism, madam, and it is lazy journalism. Madam, what is your view? <laughs> Sir, what is your view? Both sides covered, I don't have to do any work. So never be neutral, never be... No. Just one second. We needn't be neutral. No, sir. I, uh, never sorry be, to uh, Just disagree. one second, madam. Just yes. one sentence. Yes. Never be neutral between the man setting the fire and the man trying to put off the fire. That's fine, but... Yes, yes. Gentlemen in front. Ma'am, we, 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 we take your point okay. and we are the right spirit. We are deliberately the members here, so we need to look into that. Absolutely, yes. Yes, sir. We'll take the last question here from the gentleman here. Yes. Sir, so the way the CBA director has been ousted, the CBA director has been ousted, uh, Mr. Mallikarjun Karge, who is one of the member of the special committee, has insisted for a personal hearing from the director before ousting him. But that has, but, but that has not, not been accepted, that has been rejected. Still, Congress is not doing enough to oppose such things, such blatant, uh, uh, the blatant dictator, dictatorial kind of things. So, do you think Congress will be a, a strong alternative in these instances or does, is, this, is this a reflection of how Congress will behave in such matters in future? Sir, don't worry about what others are doing. Are we objecting forcefully enough or not? Please ask that. Secondly, it's not just Mr. Karge. Not just The most important statement that has come yesterday is the one that the Indian Express in the North has published today, their lead story, that Justice Patnayak, who was asked to oversee the, uh, the CVC's examination of these allegations, he has said that the CVC's things were not right, and he has said that this, uh, the way this Prime Minister-led panel has proceeded is completely wrong. That's the most important thing, and media should pick it up, and others should follow it up. And I'm sure that these papers and all can be got. All right, we should not, so don't worry about whether Congress is doing it or not, but whether the media is doing it, whether individual citizens are doing it or not. But Congress seems to be the likely... The all right, okay, that's, uh, we, we can go on and on, but that's all the time we have for... Nee, fact, uh, if the Congress will do like that, we will oppose the Congress also? What is the problem? <laughs> Since, uh, since quotas are the flavor of the season, I also took a 10% extra quota and uh, because we started a little late, so I finished on time if you consider that 10% quota. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for, for uh, I think, setting the tone for elections 2019.